Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to today's session of Real Time with Maroxa. Hopefully, everybody can hear me, see me uh, fantastically. I'm joined by two special guests today. So um, I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to, to get settled in before we go ahead and get started. All right, looks like we have a bunch of attendees rolling in. So I'll give everybody a few minutes. While we're waiting, a couple of housekeeping things. Today's session will be recorded. Um, we're going to also post a blog post with um, a lot of the information we're sharing today. And if anyone has any questions along the way in this webinar, um, you have the ability to ask in the Q&A section. Just put them in the chat. Um, we'll have folks that are going to answer questions along the way, but we're also going to save some time at the end to do some live uh, Q and A. All right, just a couple more minutes um, as people roll in. Two past the hour is uh, you know maybe we should wait till three or four. What do you what do you guys think? The modern world of Zoom etiquette seems to go back and forth between expecting a meeting to start exactly on time, and if someone's 30 <laughs> seconds late, then something's wrong, or, you know, five, six, seven, eight minutes, somewhere in there. Yeah, we, we've kind of started. We just did the content. Um, so, yeah, let me just see. It looks like a bunch of people are coming in still. We'll, oh, one more minute, and we'll kick off. Again, those of you who are just joining, um, thank you for joining Real Time with Maroxa today for our live session to um, talk about real-time categorical-based anomaly detection. Um, so again, a couple of housekeeping things, ask Q&A in the chat, we'll answer them along the way, and then we'll have a section at the end to answer those. And um, we're gonna record the session and post a blog afterwards. All right, well, Let's go ahead and get started without uh, without further ado. So thanks everyone for joining with Real Time with Maroxa. I am joined by um, a couple special guests today. So I'm excited to, to have them with me. It's, it's, it's not often that I'm not the smartest guy in the virtual room, but today definitely is the case. Um, so let me, uh, let me introduce myself and then I'll pass it off to the other folks to introduce themselves. So. Jamie Alaperti, I'm here with Maroxa leading sales and solutions. So excited to talk about um, the joint opportunity to work together um, with Maroxa and that. Uh, so let me um, let me pass it over to Ali. And Ali, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, um, Ali Hamidi, uh, CTO and co-founder at Maroxa. Um, before starting Maroxa with, with Tavares, uh, I was um, at Heroku, uh, part of the Heroku data team, uh, mainly focused on uh, Kafka and, and uh, that product line. Um, I've always worked in and around data. That's kind of been uh, you know, throughout my career. Um, yeah, super excited to be here and, and uh, show what, what you know, Maroxa and that dot can do together. Hand off to uh, Ryan. Thanks. Um, I'm Ryan Wright, founder and CEO of that dot. Um, I'm a software engineer um, by background and I have spent about the last 20 years leading data science and data platform teams. Um, so especially building software around uh, questions like how do you consume a, har a huge amount of data and interpret it on the fly uh, as it moves through. So that has included leading research teams on DARPA funded projects and building lots of commercial software along the way. All right, awesome. Well, thanks both of you for joining us today. It sounds like we have two, two founders, also like some experts in large scale data and how to process it and make some insights out of it. So, you know, today we're going to focus on how to handle categorical data and find some anomalies. Um, before we do that, why don't, why don't we talk a little bit about the two companies being represented here? So, Ali, if you can give us just an idea of, um, you know, what Maroxa does and why, why you founded it. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, Maroxa is a, a code-first data platform. Um, so, essentially, what that means is um, our goal is to empower software engineers to play the role of a data engineer and, and actually build uh, data products or data apps and derive value out of the data. Um, the main focus for us is really allowing uh, people to build data apps in languages that they, they like to use 
Uh, and so, you know, one of the supported languages, whether it's uh, JavaScript, Python, or Go, um, we don't force any strange uh, DSL or anything like that. It's really just writing idiomatic code. Um, Devaris, my co-founder, always likes to say regular ass code, regular ass dev workflows. Um, that's really the focus, right? It's, it's things that you're used to, things that you're familiar with. So you're writing, um, you know, Go in your favorite IDE, you're committing things to, to Git, um, and you're deploying through CLI. So things that you're, you're super familiar with. Um, once you, you write your data app, uh, we actually deploy that on the platform. We wire up everything. Um, we, we do the heavy, uh, the heavy lift of actually making sure that the data from the resource that you're pulling from, uh, gets to your, your custom logic. Um, and then, you know, we pass it down the line and, and deliver it to where it needs to go. Um, and so, yeah, the platform sort of handles the idiosyncrasies of, of the various types of resources, um, so that the, the, the end user and the developer doesn't really have to worry about it. They just write code, they ship it to the platform, it, it wires up everything and, and processes that uh, data. That's nice. fantastic. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, and Marox has been around for um, two and a half years now, and we've got some very large customers um, using us to, to really remove the complexity around building with data, um, as Ali mentioned. Um, cool. That sounds great. Um, Ryan, why don't you tell us a little bit about, about that dot? Yeah, absolutely. So that dot is a, a young startup founded to turn high volume data into high value data. <clears throat> um, and related to what I was talking about with my background, the, it's really a focus on data platform and consuming data in high volume streams. And then trying to answer this question about what does that data mean? And that's uh, a pretty complex and multifaceted question. And so that dot has created open source software that we call Quine. Uh, to address this in new ways that can scale to new heights. So Quine is the world's first streaming graph. Um, it's like a graph database, but it's focused on high volume data streams and scales past a million events per second. Um, and we also developed a second product, which is the focus of our conversation today, uh, which is uh, what we call novelty detection. It's a, um, it's a tool for finding what is unusual in your high volume data stream with a focus on uh, the data in that uh, data stream that usually goes unused and unnoticed, that categorical data. So being able to look at it as it streams through and turn that into answers about how unusual is this thing flying through my data pipeline. Okay, great. So I, um, I know we're definitely focused on uh, the categorical fraud detection use cases. Brian, while you're talking about that, uh, what are some other common um, use cases that you folks are seeing? Yeah, fraud detection is a very common one. There's a number of use cases in the cybersecurity world and uh, in the fintech world, um, as, as well as a number of other uh, different areas and different verticals. Um, use cases are really all have this theme about how do I take a whole bunch of data and put it together and understand what that data means? Um, and so finding attackers in high volume event streams of cybersecurity data uh, has been an important one, monitoring fraud or uh, monitoring transactions in uh, financial applications has been another. Nice. Um, that makes sense. Ali, why don't I turn that same question back to you? I mean, what are the common use cases that you're seeing in Maraxa? Yeah, some, some of the more common ones are, you know, things, uh, you know, straightforward use cases like um, pulling data from your operational data store into a data warehouse. Um, you know, we make that very easy. We can do the transformation uh, in flight. Um, things like uh, streaming analytics, um, sort of alerting and event-driven uh, sort of applications where you're watching uh, different sort of databases or sources that are uh, processing, you know, backing it, an application. Uh, whenever something happens, you want to trigger some additional workflows. Um, those types of uh, uh, use cases are pretty common for us. Okay, great. So I've heard a lot around you know, large volumes of data, real time, and, you know, getting to valuable insights. So um, uh, without further ado, I think what we should talk about is really what we're talking about today. So Ryan, can you, can you dive into this categorical data and, and numeric and the differences? And, you know, I know me personally, when, when we were prepping for this and I learned about all the use cases today that are around anomaly detection and are really focused on numeric data, um, it was pretty eye-opening. So, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more from your own words. Yeah, absolutely. The um, uh, anomaly detection has been around for a long time. 
Um, so almost since there's been data processing, there have been techniques developed to go look at that data and say, what's unusual in this data? Have the computer tell you so you don't need a human to go comb through and read and understand every piece of data flying through. Um, and so there have been some really incredible anomaly detection algorithms developed over the years. Um, isolation for us is kind of the current state of the art um, for, uh, for finding anomalies in data. What all of those techniques have in common though, is that they work on numeric data. So if your data is numbers, those techniques can be extremely effective. Um, and, you know, and entire great applications have been built on top of that for watching, you know, vibration and manufacturing systems, you know, or, uh, you know, anything that can be measured as a number uh, like that, like, how, you know, how much of something is happening. But there's a huge class of data that goes untouched and really has no answer in the anomaly detection space. It's, that's categorical data. So categorical data is really anything that's not a number. Um, it's all the other pieces of information that we use on a more normal everyday kind of uh, basis where uh, like names are a categorical value. Um, IP addresses are categorical values, things like colors um, or even times of day or, or categories in the day. You know, these are categorical values, file paths, um, usernames, identifiers, all of those are really important pieces of data that don't fit neatly as numbers. Um, and so uh, if you try to use traditional anomaly detection techniques with that kind of data, you're just out of luck. You get terrible results. Um, you couldn't interpret the results even if you tried. Um, and so our, our team was really focused as a part of our uh, research on creating new capabilities where we can go use that data that gets neglected and kind of sits by the wayside so often, use that as part of the analysis process to figure out what in this data is actually so meaningful. That's, that's awesome, Ryan. So I guess when people don't use this categorical data in their anomaly detection, like what, you know, what are the potential risks? Um, well, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of uh, data is everywhere now. And the question is always, you know, what and how to interpret that data. And so different, different problem spaces and different use cases uh, take a stream of data and say, great, now let's go find the answers in that data. Um, and if, depending on your problem, if you've got um, uh, like a cybersecurity problem, for example, we've done a lot of work in this space. Um, you want to find the attacker. You want to find the bad guy in this data. And so the question is what behaviors in that data signify the, the bad guy doing something that we care about? Um, all that behavioral information is in categorical data, not the numeric data. And so I've, I've seen it over and over again where teams try to consume a data stream and say, let's find the anomalies in this data. And they say, well, we've got some off the shelf algorithms uh, so we can go you know, apply those. What numeric data do we have? We have maybe you know bytes in and out across network traffic. Um, you know, time of day can be represented as a number, um, and so the teams tend to gravitate toward just using whatever data is numeric and fits in the traditional algorithms. And meanwhile, all the behavioral information about the stuff that they actually care about—that's all categorical. You know, file names mm -hmm. are categorical, and they're a really important part of understanding what's this attacker doing in a in a system. Um, and the username, which user is using it, what process is using it, you know, from what IPs, from what machines, all of that is categorical data. And that's really where the behavioral information lies. And so being able to take that and actually use that as, as a part of the analysis um, is critical to finding good informative answers. And that's really been out of reach for a long time. So, uh, so one of the things we hope to do is help bring uh, some insight or some awareness to this question of what kind of data are we working with? And we want to find an answer. Where does that answer lie? In what kind of data? Well, let's bring some more tools to the table as well. Right. Yeah. And people probably are just getting to some answers quickly with this numeric data and like, oh, great, I get an answer. Meanwhile, yeah. they're just forgetting about all the behavioral information, what's happening over time yeah. and missing out on the detail. It's awesome. There's there's been some amazing research over the years of trying to take categorical values and turn them into numbers. 
Um, and occasionally there's been some really stunning results of, uh, of just really impressive successes there. But most of the time that doesn't really work. And even if it does work, it uh, requires this slow offline batch process mm -hmm. um, that can't generalize to unseen data. Um, and so it, that, that transformation process of trying to turn these categorical values into numbers um, on one hand has, has been incredible, but in practice, in the real world, it's just not a way to handle uh, streaming data in real time. Right. You so. Yeah, so if you do the transformation, you lose the whole real time, which kind of defeats the purpose. And, th and then you created a new problem for how to go back and explain the answers that you got or to understand what these, you know, these new anomaly scores are telling you about numbers that are supposed to represent categorical values. And so there's just right. that whole challenge of moving back and forth between the space of categorical data and numeric data. And, uh, and, you know, it's largely been driven by the absence of tools for working with categorical data itself in its native form. Yeah, it's like, oh, great, we found this awesome anomaly. It happened weeks ago, and this is the score. We got to, and these are all the problems that happened since. <laughs> yeah, or, or what um, happens more often is, you know, hey, we turned on the system and we've got uh, 600,000 anomalies. So, um, you know, where's the Security Operations Center staff uh, you know, guys, we need your help. We need you to, to kind of comb through 600,000 anomalies to figure out which of them is real. And that's when you hear the news like, oh, there was a breach six months ago at this yeah, company. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. So, you know, why does it take so long to find this stuff? You know, well, it's it's this after the fact analysis of huge, like just a deluge of data and information and signal that isn't really signal. It's not really the answer it's buried in a lot of misinterpretation and a lot of problems in the process of converting back and forth between these data types. Okay, well, I think that's a pretty good setup. It sounds like this categorical data and analyzing it in real time to find the value um, can be pretty impactful from a business standpoint. So why don't, um, why don't we see how you can do this in, uh, in a live demo? So Ali, let me stop sharing. And right. you should be able to start sharing on your end. Yeah. Uh, before before I, I sort of go into the, the demo, I just want to sort of set the scene on on what we what it is that we're we're doing. Um, and so essentially, what I what I did is I I created a turbine app. Um, that's our our code first uh, framework that essentially pulls um, user activity from a an operational database. This could be a, a database that's powering a web application or a mobile application or so sort of aggregating logs somehow. Um, it basically pulls those records uh, in real time through change data capture. Um, it actually sends those to uh, that dot uh, novelty detector in real time. It gets back the, the, the score and then it writes it back into a database for you know, usage uh, downstream. Um, and so this is kind of the, the, the use case. This is the, the scenario that we're setting. And so the idea here is lots of you know, activities happening it's pretty normal. Everything looks good, and then we want to be able to pick out what's what's unusual, what's where the novel uh, behavior is, so that we can actually uh, do something about it. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right. Um, so first off, uh, I'm just going to walk through what a a turbine app looks like. Um, so you, I'm sharing my uh, IDE, and so this is uh, GoLand. This is the, the JetBrains uh, Go IDE. Uh, but Turbine is, is basically ID agnostic. So as long as you're using a supported language, you can use you know, Vim, VS Code, whatever it is that you, that you want. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick uh, walkthrough uh, through some of the more interesting areas inside the Turbine app. Um, our CLI actually generates the, the template for this. So you, you kind of go in and you have a starting point where you can just fill in the, the, the interesting parts. Um, so here, we're, we're basically uh, accessing a resource called Novelty DB. This happens to be a Postgres database um, that is already registered on the platform. Uh, we're saying, you know, from this database, pull the collection or table user activity. Uh, and so it creates a, a stream of that, uh, those events from that table. Uh, we're registering some secrets that are used by the Novelty server. So uh, where the Novelty server is, how to access it, what the credentials are. Um, and then we're saying for this stream, which is uh, pulled from this collection, process it using this de detect novelty function, uh, which is written in line here. 
and then take those results uh, and write them out into a new collection called user underscore activity enriched. Um, so this could be uh, a number of things. It could be a, a table in a different database. It could be a completely different uh, resource. You could publish it to Kafka. You can fire off um, you know, HTTP post requests into Slack or whatever it is that you want. Uh, just for the sake of this demo, I'm writing it back into um, a table so that we can we can view it in a dashboard. Um, and so what does the, the, the tech novelty process actually do? And so here we're getting uh, access to that novelty server. Um, I'm generating a new client. So I actually wrote a very simple REST client to a uh, novelty detector. <clears throat> and then I'm submitting an observation um, for the, the actual record. Uh, and then when I get that response back, I pass it out through the, the pipeline that gets written into the, the database. Um, an interesting part, which you know, I, I kind of learned along the way working with the that all team is that you know, going from uh, these arbitrary uh, records into something that's a little bit more formatted, a little bit more optimized for um, uh, novelty detector and sort of categorical data is really things like uh, taking a timestamp and breaking it into uh, buckets so that you can actually make better use of it. And so uh, I have this time of day function. Again, this is written in line. It's pretty uh, straightforward, but essentially it just says, you know, given a timestamp, is this um, uh, morning, afternoon, evening, or uh, afternoon, evening, or night? Uh, and that's what gets written into the observation that gets sent to, uh, to the novelty detector. Um, and so, yeah, essentially it takes the, the raw record, transforms it into a format that's optimized for a novelty detector, ships it off to novelty detector, gets it back, and then writes it into the database. So I'm just going to go through some of the, the tooling that we have. Um, so the, the turbine tooling essentially allows you to exercise the code locally. So you can see, you know, does this do the thing that I think it does? Um, so you write a bunch of code, and you want to see that it actually works. Um, and so we can do uh, Maroxa apps uh, run. And so this actually builds it locally, exercises the, the code using um, data that you've kind of sampled. Um, and it'll you know, produce the output. It would have written this record had it actually been live. And so here we can see uh, this was the payload, um, this was the detail, and this is the actual field that was returned back from a uh, novelty detector. And so, yep, you know, the, the client is working. It's actually hitting the novelty server. It's responding with, with reasonable data. Um, and so the next step is actually to deploy onto the platform. So I'm going to do Maroxa apps deploy. And so here, uh, you know, we build on top of the, you know, the Git workflow. So it checks to see if there are any uh, uncommitted changes. It will actually go through, see the resources that we are referencing. Do they exist? Can we reach them? Um, it'll actually build the, the code, uh, ship it to the platform, and the platform handles the rest where uh, it will do all the wiring. It'll create the connectors to Postgres. It'll create the stream. It'll do all those things. It'll create the, the processor function, deploy it into a cluster, make sure all the data gets to it, and, you know, do all, all of the wiring together. So this takes a few seconds. Uh, while that's happening, uh, I want to talk about uh, a script. Uh, in order to kind of exercise this, this code, <clears throat> I needed to, uh, to generate oh, that should be right, um, to generate some, some sample data. So I have a, a Ruby script that uses the faker gem. Um, so essentially, it creates like fake user data. Um, it creates like emails, names. Uh, and that kind of stuff. So I have this data gen script. Um, essentially, it creates a bunch of fake users and then creates um, events. So it'll say, you know, this user logged in from this location at this time, and then this user uh, logged out at this, you know, from this location at this time. Um, and so essentially, what what, I'm, what we do is we get it to generate a bunch of records. Uh, it starts pouring those into the database, uh, and those are sort of considered normal behavior for this particular user. Uh, and then I have a separate script, which is, you know, create anomalous location, where it basically takes one of these users that are already created and says, well, now this user is going to log in from a location that they don't normally log in from. Um, and so if this works as we, we hope, uh, it should flag that as being something novel, something, something different uh, or unexpected. Um, all right. So I'm going to switch to a different window. And I put together a, a simple dashboard that shows, there we go. 
Um, it's a superset dashboard. It's just pulling that uh, table for user activity enriched. Uh, right now, there are no results. Uh, so I'm going to generate some, some events. So off screen, I'm just producing uh, 100 events of you know, user activity. So we should start seeing them flow in. So it's refreshing. And you can see um, Mary Beth updated their profile from Birmingham, UK, at a particular timestamp. Uh, scoring is you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. As you create more events and it sees more events, what it understands to be normal kind of settles and you get this baseline. Um, so I'm going to create a few more. And so it's just refreshing automatically. And you can see um, it'll start to tend towards green as it realizes this is pretty normal behavior. So here we can see it's very green. Um, you know, Lou updated the profile from San Antonio. That's what they do all the time at this particular time of the day. It's all good. Uh, and then I'm going to create a anomalous record, which basically says pick a random user, make them do something that they don't normally do from a location they don't normally do. Um, and there we go. So right, actually, conveniently, it's right after the event. So Lindsay is typically, you know, logging in from Philadelphia at a particular time. Uh, and then the anomalous event was actually she, you know, logged in from Tokyo at, at a time. And you can immediately see the score is, um, you know, much higher. And it's highlighting that this is this is something that's uh, unexpected. Um, and so, yeah, the, what's happening in the background is this is real time. It's creating a, a CDC stream, so you're getting, you know, like sub second, very low latency uh, stream from Postgres uh, as records are changed. Uh, it's being processed on the platform. It's sent to novelty detector. It's getting back the score. It's writing it into this uh, uh, into a database, and then I have this dashboard that's just kind of looking at it. Um, I wanted to kind of highlight the fact that really it's it's the behavior they're interested in, right? So here we we know that Lindsay logging in from Tokyo at this time is unusual, um, and that's the thing that we're we're trying to highlight. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the end of my, my demo. Hopefully that's you know, pretty clear. Very cool. And, and the data being fed in for this uh, is a series of strings. Is that right? Yeah, so it's a, like a database record. So it basically looks like, um, it looks like this actually. I have a, an example record that you can look at. Um, so this user activity basically looks like user ID, first name, Alice, last name, logged in, this is the timestamp. Yeah, so as we look at that, I see uh, I see three different numbers on there uh, and the rest are all strings. And even those right. numbers, they're not really numbers. You know, they're they're meant to signify a special category like a user ID. And, and so this is a great example of that kind of data and emails and the type of activity. Um, that kind of data is the categorical data that we were talking about. You know, that's usually so hard to make use of, especially in a streaming context. Yeah, it's it's been uh, super awesome working with uh, Novelty detect Detector and learning about sort of categorical categorical data, um, and it's just super effective. And you know, it's really well well suited for um, what we're trying to solve here. Um, but yeah, the Markson platform makes it really easy to to kind of wire up together and and kind of uh, get the data flowing through Novelty Detector. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you showed a little bit of data prep as well before the data went in there. Can you um, maybe bounce back to what you were doing with the timestamp there? Yeah. Um, for, for a little bit of uh, background, the, uh, the novelty detector takes in strings. So, it, so categorical data can be represented perfectly with strings, um, and those are usually hard to work with for analysis. But sometimes data comes in like a timestamp where it is just a number. Um, time is this really interesting thing. It's this interesting concept, right? There's, there's usually this problem of going back and forth between how we want to look at time. Sometimes we want to think of time as this always incrementing number that just goes up all the time. Mm -hmm. Other times we want to think about time as being days of the week, you know, certain months, you know, diurnal effects of things that happen during the weekdays and not on the weekends or maybe vice versa. And so sometimes we look at time Time and and want to see it not as this ever increasing number that just goes up all the time, but as the more human representation about these categories that we care about, like which day, which month, day, you know, weekday, weekend, things of that sort. Um, so, can you mention it real quick how you were yeah. how you're handling that here? 
Yeah, so uh, I just I put up the the snippet of code. Um, it's pretty you know straightforward, and essentially it's uh, I'm bucketing based on uh, time of day. And so you know if I if I think about the the the, the problem domain you know of user activity, you know maybe during the day they're they're working you know from an office or from a building or something. And so you know morning, afternoon is probably one location, evening, night is probably another location. So that's kind of where I, I centered it. Um, and really broke the the time zones into those those four buckets. Um, but like you mentioned, it could be anything, right? It could be days of the week versus weekend. And so that could be categories that you split out too. And it would be really trivial to do that because at the end of the day, it's just code. Um, so here I'm taking um, the initially the um, like the Unix epoch timestamp, you know, the the big number that always grows. Um, and then I'm sort of breaking it into the individual components and saying, all right, you know, what is the hour component of this? Um, does it fall into you know morning, afternoon, or evening? And that's what I'm spitting out as a string, and that's what I'm actually uh, formatting in the observation. And so when we create the observation, we're kind of splitting up into the time of day, the country, the city, the email, that kind of thing. And so we can say, uh, here's the thing that happened, you know, in this particular time block. Um, and then novelty detector can do its thing and say this is you know uh, novel in some way. Yeah, and for a little bit more behind the scenes for the novelty detector itself, it, uh, 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 Ali was showing the whole pipeline here of feeding in data, starting with an empty data set, uh, and then feeding the data set in and having uh, useful scores come back. Um, then the novelty detection application learns on its own. It doesn't require labeled data. You really just feed it whatever categorical data you're observing. Um, and in cases of things like the, the timestamp, you can convert some numbers on the way um, so that they get turned into categorical data. And as that comes into the novelty detector app, under the hood, it's learning, it's adapting, it's figuring out what does your data look like. Um, and it's building its, its understanding of what's common and what's atypical. Um, and the novelty detection system, part of, part of how the algorithm works under the hood is it will uh, pay attention to things that are genuinely novel, not just things that we've never seen before. So uh, sometimes you've never seen some data before, but it can be common to see new data in, the, in that mm -hmm. corner of the data set. Um, and so under the hood, the novelty detection tool builds this graph model of the data, a compressed model to understand what is common, what is abnormal, um, and is it normal to see lots of new data that we've never seen before? If so, that gets learned very quickly and, we and it gets assigned a low score. But it's these other corners of the data where something that we've, we've learned the fingerprint for how this corner of the data typically behaves. You know, we know what Lindsay Harbor does, um, you know, yeah. and how she typically logs in. Yeah. So when she does something different, like logging in from the other side of the world <laughs> later, Kind of an extreme, extreme example, but um, <laughs> yeah, demonstrates it well. Uh, it's actually, it's been super cool working with this and, and you know, like the, the color branding I added, you know, just for, for like making it super obvious, but it's actually really cool to see it settle very quickly on what is normal behavior. And so yeah. if I generate like another, you know, hundred events, um, it starts getting like very, very green and you're like, this is totally yeah. normal. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's cool. Uh, it's, it's really, work. it works so well. Um, yeah, super impressive. You know, and it, it kind of bellow, it blows my mind too. There's a um, there's a certain uh, capability that we want from our data systems. I think that is often the unsung hero, um, and and not talked about. Usually, we talk about how do we find what's bad. Tell me the bad things. You know, what's you know what's going wrong in this data. Um, the flip side of that is knowing with confidence that everything's fine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's equally important. Or more important potentially because you know your steady state is what you spend you know the vast majority of your time in like is that the steady state is this what i should expect um yeah i think that's that's brilliant um but yeah like i just dumped in a bunch more data and you can see it's it's pretty green now it's pretty confident that these this is normal behavior yeah very cool and and so streaming all this in real time was really just the matter of uh, that code that you're showing ali of, of just setting it up in the maroxa platform with yeah uh, with a Go script and a Ruby script for data gen in that case, for examples, and yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's it's not it's not even that much uh, code to be honest. Um, the the platform does a lot of the the heavy lifting in terms of actually getting the data out. That's really our our sweet spot is you know knowing how how best to get data out of particular uh, sources. And so 
this example um, references Postgres. But actually, if I if behind the scenes I you know I swap this out with like a Mongo database, uh, the code would be identical, um, and we would generate a uh, a connector to the change stream, um, or it could be SQL Server, or it could be whatever, right? Um, and so you're just swapping that out, and the platform is you know figuring out you know this is how I get data out. I'm going to make that data available to this function. The function is going to do its thing, um, and then in the function, you know it's basically just regular code. So you can import packages. You can you can do whatever uh, business logic you want. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, super and cool. All, and all this in real time, so we don't have to we don't have to collect <laughs> storm or collect data, store it somewhere, and then pull it into this batch process and find out what what Lindsay was doing tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, and so, you know, I, while while putting together this turbine app, I, I thought about you know what would next steps be, right? So for this example, I'm writing it into Postgres because it's powering a dashboard. Um, but we could have quite easily, you know, in parallel, also fire off a web hook, uh, a web request into you know Slack. And so maybe my you know security Slack channel will get lit up whenever uh, an uh, you know unexpected event occurs. Um, I could push it into another Kafka topic where I can stream it in real time. I could do pretty much anything, right? And you can do them in parallel. You can kind of do, I want to persist it because I need the historical data for audit purposes, uh, but I also want to trigger an event to, to act on it immediately. Um, and so, yeah, it would just be a case of, you know, adding another destination, uh, maybe adjusting the logic to, to do whatever it is that you need it to do. Yeah, that's awesome. And I know we built the novelty detector to scale out horizontally so it could handle any volume of data as well. Is, is scale something that gets a lot of your focus as well, Ali? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, underneath the hood, we, we're building, uh, we built a lot of the platform on uh, Kafka. And so if you know anything about Kafka, it's designed to, to really handle, you know, huge amounts of uh, throughput uh, and really scale uh, in that aspect. Um, and similarly, our, our sort of processing uh, functionality is sort of built on top of uh, serverless infrastructure. So we actually scale that dynamically too. Um, and so if you just, you know, hit it with a, a ton of data, it'll actually scale both of those components up process all the data and then, you know, um, sort of wind it back down. So yeah, that's, that's definitely something that we, we think about. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big, big part of uh, what we're focusing on. Very cool. That was going to be my first question. This looks great with small data, <laughs> but how does it scale in real time? Yeah. Um, you know, Kafka can, can easily scale to, you know, millions of requests per second. Um, if you have a big enough cluster and yeah, on our side, that's, that's what we're building on top of. Yeah. And for novelty detection as well. So it's uh, it's meant to scale out horizontally so it can have uh, as many uh, members in a cluster participating together to consume the data stream um, and handle any volume of data. Um, for novelty detector as well, it can it can operate with kind of this sliding window. So you know one of the one of the challenges with using machine learning or other uh, data interpretation tools in a data stream is that you get model drift and you know slowly changes over time and so what were good results at the start of your stream become you know poor results much later in the stream um, and so uh, features for handling that are built into novelty detector as well um, where it can look at you know the sliding window of recent data or it can keep a static baseline to say here's what we know is always a typical representation of behavior and then score new updates based on either of those two modes of operation wow that's pretty cool yeah i know that novel drift model drift is always a hot topic when it comes to doing that real-time analytics yeah um so we do have some questions that people have asked um, along the way. So I can I can go ahead and ask those and you guys can answer them. And, and that'll be kind of a wrap up of our session today. Recording will be available. Um, we'll post a blog with the code. Um, and uh, uh, the first question is, how long did it take you to create the app, get it up and running for both turb Turbine and Novelty Detector? Uh... Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, it really, uh, not not much time at all. Like if you look at the the code, it's it's published, um, it's available on GitHub, so you can actually look at it. Um, it's very little actual code. Um, maybe the only uh, thing which I had to kind of put much thought into was writing a REST client for Novelty Detector, uh, their API. Um, but they use um, OpenAPI or Swagger, and so you can actually look at it, and it's very straightforward. 
Uh, and even then, I'm basically only using one endpoint, which is the uh, observe endpoint. Uh, so even the client is, is pretty straightforward. You're just making web requests. Um, so I think in total, probably a matter of hours at most. And a lot of it was, you know, figuring out how how best to use novelty detector, not so much how to get data to it. So the 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 idea of you know creating the time of day buckets versus just sending it the timestamp, that was something that you know we learned by by chatting with the the that all team. Um, and so making that change was was kind of a, a interactive. Um, but actually setting up um, you know turbine, it's pretty straightforward. You create the account, you install the CLI. You can, uh, there's a command to initialize a new project and it gives you this boilerplate and you just fill in uh, the blanks. Um, and then for a novelty detector, um, I went to the marketplace and, and set that up, but I think uh, um, Ryan can kind of talk a little bit more about setting that up too. Yeah, novelty detector is available on the Amazon marketplace um, uh, with all the usual free tier stuff and you can go and poke and play. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's really just a matter of kind of clicking a, a, a CloudFormation uh, deployment button, uh, giving it two or three minutes, and then you're off and running. Yeah, there was, it was like no no effort at all, basically just waiting for, for Amazon to do its thing. And then the, the instance was up and running, and I just plugged the URL into the Turbine app, and we were done. Right, and I can imagine um, with using Turbine and Novelty Detector, it was you know, low on the resource side, but if you didn't have these tools, you know, you'd probably need several different people, a lot of time um, to get old batch results. Yeah. I, I think the, the typical workflow would uh, layer in some data scientists to go, you know, play with some toy data sets and then test it out on some large data sets a week later. Um, and then once they get their model set up, they'd bring it to their uh, data engineering team and say, Hey, we figured out this algorithm we should try to run. Can you figure out uh, some code that we can uh, yeah. run and test it on, plug it into Kafka here, you know, a couple of weeks later, and then, you know, go try it on production data a few weeks after that. Um, and so it, normally I'd say you'd be up and running in, in a good four or five months. Yeah, for sure. Um, and even then, like the quality of the results would be, you know, who knows what you'll, you'll get. And you have this sort of massive infrastructure burden as a as a side effect, and you have this team of people working on this one specific problem. Nice. So this sounds like a good uh, money saver than this combo here. Um, speaking of that, you mentioned this, Ryan, and this is another question. There's a free tier um, for Novelty Detector, and I can tell you there's a free tier for Meroxa. So anyone who wants to try this out, the blog post will walk you through step by step, but you can do it. You can do it for free. Yeah. 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 So press, press a button, get started, try it, see if it works in your use case uh, for your workflow, uh, and then kind of open new doors for what's possible uh, in terms of answers in real time as a part of your data flow. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. There's another question. Um, somebody typed in this morning, the Maroxa CEO, Devaris Brown, tweeted that. Um, you could save money on Splunk. Um, how, how does this make that possible? <laughs> so, so you know, Splunk has a lot of users and a lot of people uh, get a lot of value from using Splunk. Um, and most of the time it's because they put a lot of data into Splunk to, and they're trying to find that needle in the haystack. Um, they're trying to find the small bits of data that are actually the meaningful thing that they really care about. Um, and for everybody who loves Splunk, uh, there's, uh, you've also found a person who hates Splunk's pricing model um, and pays Splunk way too much money. Um, and that database pricing you know, in Splunk just kills everybody who's using it. Um, and so, so one of the things we've been kicking around is, uh, you know, well, why not save yourself 90% of your Splunk bill? by taking the data that's moving through your system and before you send it to Splunk, go ahead and feed it through a pipeline like Ali showed you here. Score it to see what is unusual. And instead of sending uh, 100 million copies of the same boring record over to Splunk and then paying for every single one of those records in Splunk, why don't you just send to Splunk the interesting data, the novel data, you know, the stuff that scores even somewhat relatively high. Um, send that data into Splunk 
um, and filter down your Splunk bill arbitrarily, you know, cut it down to just 10% or 5% of what you were paying for Splunk. Um, and, you know, if it, if it takes an hour to stand up and poke at a pipeline like that uh, to save a few million dollars on your Splunk bill, that could be time well served. Yes, that makes sense. So that could be a destination. Ali um, sent it back to Postgres, but why not send it to Splunk on the, the information that you want? Okay. Yep. Now that makes sense to me. Um, all right. Let's see. There's some other ones. Um, I think we talked about this one already a little bit, but besides cybersecurity, what are the other use cases for novelty detector? Yeah, we, we have customers using it uh, in the financial space quite a bit in a number of interesting ways. So watching for fraud, monitoring fraud, um, you know, fraud tends to be a similar behavioral analysis sort of a problem. You know, there's lots of different factors about what's happening um, and, and feeding that data in so that you can get real time answers, say, while someone's logging into an account. Um, you know, to be able to detect authentication fraud as a part of that process so that instead of giving the bad guy, you know, free and clear access to, you know, the executive's email account or, you know, their, their private login to, to some private service, um, detect that in real time as a part of the workflow so that you can actually stop bad, guy, bad guys and keep that data loss and, and that, you know, expensive data breach uh, that you'd learn about nine months later keep that from happening in the first place. Um, also in the, in the financial space, we've seen users use it for, um, for auditing and looking at financial transactions um, you know, with an auditing perspective to, to say, you know, what is, what's going on with these financial transactions? And, and the first thought is, well, you know, financial transactions are about money, right? They're, they're, some amount of money was spent on something here. So that's a number. We can use that number. We can use traditional methods. Except you can't because the auditing process is about everything that isn't a number. It's which user was doing it, from what account to what receiver, um, what time of day, you know, what was the, the lineage or the, the kind of the purchase process authorization, you know, workflow. You know, all those pieces of the puzzle are the categorical data that tells us about the money number that we care about. And so that sort of analysis. Um, on, on the fly and, you know, as, as in this automated fashion um, can just dramatically save a whole lot of time and effort um, from financial auditors or other people trying to understand what's going on with the purchases in this system. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, sounds like a lot of good um, financial technology use cases uh, can certainly be solved with this combination of uh, turbine and novelty detector. Um, let's see here. We have one more about cloud platforms that are supported by um, Maroxa Turbine and Novelty Detector. Uh, Ali, yeah. you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, currently, if you go to maroxa.com and you sign up uh, and you land on our multi-tenant sort of freemium tier, um, the, the actual sort of uh, server in the back end, the platform itself is running on AWS. Um, but you can connect to resources anywhere, right? As long as it's it's reachable. And actually, we have the ability to um, do SSH tunneling as well. So if you have resources, you know, databases, Kafka clusters, whatever it is, running on GCP or Azure or anywhere else, um, you can still use those. You can reach them and and you can interact with them. Um, as you go towards more of the um, sort of higher, uh, sort of more strict requirements around security and isolation, uh, we have other options for creating. Uh, you know, isolated environments specifically for particular customers, uh, in which case you could deploy it uh, pretty much anywhere you like. Um, so we can, you know, deploy it on bare metal if that's what you want or, or somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, if you just land on the free tier, um, the freemium one, the multi-tenant one, you can reach resources anywhere, uh, but the, the core infrastructure runs on AWS. And similar story for novelty as well. Um, you know, it's on the AWS marketplace and meant to be quick and easy to press a button and spin it up. Um, but we've got enterprise customers who are deploying it, you know, on-premise in their environments on different kinds of machines. Um, then the novelty application itself uh, gets packaged as a Java application that runs on cross-platform in lots of different kinds of environments. Jamie. Uh, Sorry, I, I can't I use the mute button, button apparently. 
<laughs> um, conscious of time, um, we took a good 50 minutes because um, you guys had some good content to share today, answered some good questions for the folks. Um, but yeah, I mean, some call to actions if anyone wants to learn more. Um, the blog will be posted on both of our websites, so maroxa.com and that dot dot io, I think, Ryan. That dot dot com. Yep. Dot com. All right, perfect. And, um, and yeah, thanks everyone for joining. We'll post the recording uh, tomorrow. Share as much as you like. And, and I appreciate you both attending today. That was a great story and uh, excited to see the, the, the passion about the use cases and, and how easy it is to do live. Likewise, fun conversation. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you very thanks, much. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ali.